Okay, hey everybody, uh, welcome to uh, the Campus Conversation Series. I am Josh Mora, I'm the Program Director for Sports Marketing and Media here at Full Sail University. Uh, we have a terrific guest for you today, for those of you who are in the room, as well as everybody who is joining us online via the live stream. Uh, for you who are joining us on the live stream, uh, you can find the chat uh, box, and there should be a tab for you to click on if you have a question along the way that's being monitored and we get to the Q&A portion, uh, we will ask some of your questions. There's also a hashtag for this. It is, it's, it's meant to be SMMBS Speaks, but there's only one S in the middle. So it's SMMB Speaks. Cool? All right, you guys want to uh, talk some soccer and soccer business here in Orlando? Let's do that. I, 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 yeah, me, me too. And I'm really excited about this because um, you know, this organization, Orlando City Soccer, has existed here for five seasons. And I don't think there is a hotter sport in America than soccer. And I don't think there's a hotter team in this sport uh, than Orlando City. In their first year of MLS, they have just taken over this town and this part of the country. Uh, the man who has, uh, is primarily responsible for that is our guest today. He is the founder and president of Orlando City Soccer, Phil Rollins. Well, you've been here many times before, but it's always good I've to have you back. Yeah. 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 So, what I'd like you to do in 25 words or less, or a headline, okay. right now, your point of view, the state of Orlando City Soccer. Ooh. I stumped him right out of the yeah. box. How about 25 that? words or less, okay. Um, I go with our logo, Defy Expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the MLS gave to us when they came down. They came and looked at the organization and they said, what's unique about you? What, do you, what makes you different? Because we want to know that. And um, they spent a week with us. They, they interviewed us, their coaching staff, players, front office staff, everyone involved in the organization. And they came back and they said, you're about defying expectations. That's what you do. People don't expect you to do what you do on a regular basis. So I'd say, in two words, with defined expectations. Well, that's, that's well summed. That's and, I, and I think it's right, too, because when you, you know, teams aren't supposed to do what they've done, uh, to, to have this kind of wave and this kind of buzz. Um, but for you, before we go further with Orlando City, because I do want to explore that in depth for our, for our audience here, but I also want to explore you and your background. I, when did you first become a fan of soccer. I assume it was football at the time because yes, you were yeah. in England. Yeah. And, and do you remember the first time you first engaged with the sport? Yeah, I think it's, it's, um, it's what we're seeing now really in, in the US. My, my background is really akin to the young boys and girls who are going to Orlando City games today. Mm -hmm. I was taken by my father and that was kind of the tradition um, you know, back in the day. So you, your grandfather went, your father went. You know, in my case, my mother went. She was a huge soccer fan as well. So my dad took me to my first game when I was five. Which um, was whom? Stoke City, Stoke my City? hometown team. Yeah, hometown. So we, yep, yep. And were they in the premiership at the time? They, they were. Like yeah, it wasn't the premiership at the time because it's, you know, it's, back, it's right, right. back in the day. But it's but a the long time level. ago. They were the uh, but they were level top level. level. Yeah. They were in the top division. Yeah, they were. They were, they were a really good team at the time. Very good footballing team, which people don't you know, uh, exactly put together with Stoke City these days. But we were a really good footballing team at the time. And I, <clears throat> I fell in love with the game. So I played as a kid. I grew up playing going to games, season ticket holder, and you just, you fall in love with it. I think there's, there's something about like tonight, you know, we got a game tonight. Um, night games for me are really special because you get under the lights, um, the whole atmosphere changes. When it's dark and you get under the floodlights and you see the players running around the field, the shadows, the noise, the chants, the singing, you know, the, the, just the, the, the play of light um, in a stadium in the evening games is very, very different to a day game. And so you just get drawn in, you know, as a, as a small boy, I was just, I was like a moth to a flame. I love the game, love the sport. Did it strike you that first moment you walked into the stadium? I think of, of Billy Crystal, the actor who talks about you know, growing up in New York and being a Yankee fan and walking up the ramp into Yankee Stadium mm -hmm. for the first time and seeing the green of the field or the green of the pitch as it may have yeah. been in Stoke. Yeah. 
Yeah, it does. I mean, it, it does. I remember it very well. There was, there was rituals, and that's what you... The one thing you miss as an owner, by the way, is rituals. One, one of the things the fans, you know, if you're a fan standpoint, like, oh, I wish I could be in the owner's box and I could know what's going on. And, you know, and the owners are like, oh, I wish I could be in the parking lot and having a beer and, like, not doing this, you know, because there's, you miss the rituals, right? Yeah. And so growing up as a kid, my ritual was in the morning, my, um, my mom would give me, like, you know, English money, so it was, like, a, a shilling, right? And I'd go up the road to the store, and I'd always buy, same thing, I'd buy a quarter of wine gums and a topic, and that was my kind of meal for, the, for game day, right? It was every, every day. I'm, no wonder I'm stuck with my superstitions. Then I'd come back down to the house, and we'd get ready. My, my dad always picked a, an older gentleman up on the way to the games. I always remember. And so we went as a threesome, and we parked in the same spot every week, and we walked to the game. And when we got inside, you know, it was, it's, you, know, you can imagine it's England, so it's wet and it's cold and it's dreary. It's winter, nothing like right. Florida. It's yeah. winter, yeah. right? Yeah, for the most part. Um, and so you, it was just the smells. It was you know the the smells of the stadium, the people, just just the, the whole thing was a, a as a kid was a very mesmeric uh, experience. And then when you get up and you walk up and take your seat, you know, it's like. Uh, and you go back to those stadiums now as an adult, and they're, they're always so much smaller than they were as a kid. Right. You know, as a kid, they were huge. Yeah. You know, and then you go inside, and they're really not that big at all. You know? When you talk about your journey to the stadium, did you find yourself parking? You parked in the same spot. Same spot. Were the same people oh, also yeah. parking in their seats around you, <coughs> sitting around you, or standing it's, around you? You, know, it's, you probably see this in Orlando City game, too. It's the same with the tailgating and where people sit and where they stand and what they do. People are creatures of habit. You know, so we used to park in the same spot. We'd stand under the stands. My father would stand in the same place. He'd always have a cup of tea. It was like, it was like you, you could almost time it. You know, there'd be a time when you had to go up to your seat. You know, there'd be a time when I would go and buy my program. And so it was, it was just, there was literally like a little regimented um, evening or afternoon. It was, it was down to the minute. And my father always, you know, he was, the only thing I didn't like about it was he always wanted to leave before the final whistle because he always wanted to get off and get ahead of the traffic, mm -hmm. which I never understood. <laughs> right, so I, I I I now kind of religiously stay till the end. Yeah. So yeah, that was always our rule yeah. too. It, it, football was always yeah. American football. Two scores with less than three has to be more than two scores with less than right. three minutes to play. Otherwise, right. you don't leave because you never know. Yeah. Uh, same in, in English football. And of course, uh, at Orlando City, you, you don't leave because everything happens in the last five minutes. Right? To be the right. This so year. you come in at 85 minutes and like the game's there. So yeah. and no, when you have a star don't player, do that. don't do that. Who can, who can change a game like, like yeah. uh, can. So at some point, you go from being a little boy fan to being yeah. a teenage and young adult fan. Yeah. How, how was being a fan at that level uh, different <clears throat> from being... I think that's when you really, you, know, you really get into the game and you get into the players and, and the tactics and the transfers uh, and the movement between clubs and the history of the clubs and the games. And, and, and just... I, so I... I went from being just a Stoke City fan to being a, a, a fan of the game in its broader context um, and everything to do with it. You know, I, I mean, I, I still most times can name what colours people play in, you know, but, but in France or Spain or Portugal. I, I get some of them wrong, but I can pretty much do it. Um, and, and that's just because in those teenage years, I learnt about the game. I kind of studied the game. Um, so that's when you realise this is, it's the world's game. And there's people playing this thing everywhere, in every country. Um, and so that's when you really get, I think that's when I gained a, a real kind of global view of what the sport was all about. Um, and then I moved away. I moved away from home. So then it gets more difficult because for some strange reason, the love gets deeper. Mm -hmm. When you can't, it's like a girlfriend you can't see every week, right? <laughs> so, you know, it just becomes the, the memories of it and the vision of it and everything else. The imagination takes over. So you want it even more. So I moved away and moved down to um, the southwest of England near to Bristol. I lived down there for several years. But I would go back for games when I could. Um, and then, of course, I moved to the States. And then you do really stupid things like going home for a weekend to see a game, you know, <laughs> and, and silly things. But, sure. but you, you miss it. So yeah. you want to be part of it. And that, that feeds the tribalism that we were talking about earlier, right? I mean, there's a Very ritual so. when you're there and you can go every day. And when you're living away, it's even, even more to the point because you're looking for more people. You're who outside like you. the tribe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You have to go back to the tribe again. And it is tribal. It's, 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 um, it's a good word, Josh. It's probably, I think, the, the word that's most associated in my mind with soccer. It is tribal. It's, it's about your tribe. We're, we're building a tribe in Orlando and, and, and a very big, strong, powerful, energetic tribe, too. Yeah, and if you want to reinforce that, go to any one of the theme parks around the holidays, and you'll see, or on a week, fall weekend, 
you'll see people in Steelers jerseys and Giants jerseys mm -hmm. and, and Saints jerseys. And the reason that is is because they want to be able to strike up a conversation in line. Mm -hmm. with, oh, hey, you're from New Orleans, too. Let's, That's right. That's and you'll right. say it in an accent. So. <clears throat> we all have a need to belong, right? And, and you know, soccer teams, <clears throat> particularly soccer teams around the world, are where people belong. You, for the most part, support your hometown team. And that's what we've got here in Orlando now. We've got a team. We've got a team that's worthy of supporting, a club that's worthy of supporting, and that is building its own tribe. At what point for you did, did it occur to you that your fanaticism about soccer and about, um, and about Stoke City yeah. uh, could lead you into management or ownership? That's a good question, and, I, and it's a good question because <clears throat> I don't think it's the right question. Let me, let me, sure. let me temper it slightly to, to give you an answer. I don't think it was a point in time when that happened. What happened was I'd, I'd gone on a path as, at this point, a business person. So I was, I was used to growing a business. I was an entrepreneur. I was, uh, had my own business. Uh, I was used to growing businesses, developing businesses, planning them, uh, particularly um, the sales and marketing aspects. Uh, and so it was, was really a, a maven of businesses, if you will. I was a consultant to businesses. <clears throat> and in parallel to that, um, Stoke had gone through this, this fall off. They'd gone from being in the, in the Premier League or the, the equivalent of the Premier League. And they were down in the third tier of English football. And they were struggling. And the club was struggling. And therefore, your community struggling, your tribe struggling. And so you, you want to be able to give back. Right? So there was not a point at which I thought, uh, oh, this translates into being, you know, a leader of a football club. It was more about I was watching this club struggle that I'd grown up supporting as a kid, that, you know, my, my father and my fam whole family supported. Um, and I wanted to put it right. I just wanted it to be better. And so I got to a point where I sold my business. And I thought, right, I'm going to step in and do something about it. So it wasn't, it was just, it was literally that. That's... You know, I think every fan, when they see their team struggling, wants to be able to do that. Mm. And you, you thought you could, which is well, interesting. I knew I could. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. There was no, yeah, I knew I could. I knew I could help them. And so, because it's really not that difficult. It's really not that hard. You know, it's not, trust me, it's not that difficult to run a football club. I wouldn't be doing it if it was, right? <laughs> you know, uh, I'd be doing what you guys are doing, right? Because you're doing smart stuff. Yeah. Um, but no, seriously, it's not, it's not that difficult to do. I mean, you just, you have to apply some common sense and some logic. You have to look after your fan base. Your fan base is absolutely critical. And you, your fans, the tribe is what it's about. So you take care, you do the right thing. And you just, you, you know, I, I knew enough about business and enough about sales and marketing to know that if we put those things together, I could help it be better. And, and I knew what the fans wanted. I, I was listening, watching, and I knew what they wanted. They just wanted somebody who cared that was, driving the club forward in the right direction. How did that translate to the, the, the club moving <coughs> in the right direction from that? Yeah, um, well, for the first, you know, for the first, probably the first year, I just kind of listened. I sat and I was in board meetings and I would sit and listen and understand. And then if something came up that I felt, you know, that's not the path we should be going down or that's a mistake, then I'd, that's when I'd voice my opinion. But for the most part, I just, I absorbed things and took them in. Um, and watched, you know, you learn, you learn as much from your mistakes. In fact, you learn more from your mistakes than your triumphs, uh, for sure. So, you know, if anybody's, if anybody out there is kind of afraid of making mistakes, please don't, because that is how you learn. Um, so y you, you really learn from watching people do the wrong thing. So, and I watched us as a club do some poor things, and then, you know, well, I'll, you know, we shouldn't do that. We won't do that again, and we won't, you know, we just won't do those things again. So you... Start to put off the side the things you, the mistakes you don't want to make, um, and you start to put into place more things that you do right and well. And you just, you know, you're honest, you're open with people, and you communicate with them. And people will tell you what they want. So just, you know, be able to replay that back to them and give them back what they need and want. How long did that journey take from third tier up back up to the uh, to the top? Took us. I I joined the board in 2000, and I think it was by 2007. We were so about seven years. We were back in the Premier League. And that's that's yeah. an amazing rise. I mean, that's very rapid. Yeah. It, yeah it, yes. Yes. It, <laughs> yeah. I guess it was. Yeah. And, and and we could have done it quicker. We we had a couple of full steps along the way. We had you know we got into the playoffs a couple of times and missed out. Um, so it could have been even faster than that. But it was it was great to see that. And I think for the you know for the most part, people my age anyway, 
had given up hope. There was like, we'll, we'll never see this team back in the Premier League. So that was the nicest thing, was to be able, not just for the younger generation who are enjoying it now, but for the older generation who have been the 25 years outside the top flight to get back and enjoy that, was, was, that was a great gift. So at some point, you, you left that tribe, I mean, I'm sure Stoke is still in your heart, mm. to try building, not football, but soccer yeah. here in America. Yeah. Why was the time right? What was interesting to you about growing soccer <clears throat> in this country? Okay, so, so it's, a, it's a little complex, the path. So I'd moved to the United States 21 years ago in 1994. So all of this time I'm telling you about when I engaged with Stoke, I was actually living in Dallas, Texas. So I was, I was in the US. Um, and getting my fix, if you will, by going back, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and in doing so, I just started to take an interest in the game here as well as in the UK. And it was just very evident. And I'm talking now about probably the mid 2000s, so 2005, 6, 7, that time frame. It was kind of very obvious that the game was beginning to take off. And I say beginning, it was literally was the beginnings. But you could see certain things that were just, this game is gonna have a future in this country. Um, and I was excited about that. I wanted to be part of that because I love building things. So, you know, I, I stopped stopped working for anybody when I was about 29 and I've only worked for myself since. Um, I'm probably much unemployable at this point. I don't think anybody <laughs> take me on. Um, so you kind of got to do things for yourself. Yeah. Um, and so I really wanted to be part of that building process and be, be a part of, of what soccer could be to the United States, the biggest, mm. the biggest marketplace in the world. So that was, what, that was what motivated me. What's neat about that, to put the dates into historical context, 1994, when you first move World here Cup. is when the U.S. hosts the World Cup, yep. and it's uh, the birth of the of MLS at that point mm -hmm. as well. So exactly. you ha you had seen the first wave of yep. uh, well, there had been a wave, of course, in the late '70s with the first uh, North American Soccer yes. League. But this was really a rekindling. It was almost like starting from scratch. Yes, um, and then coming in, and now you bring in uh, a team. Now you didn't start in Orlando. You started in in um, Austin, in uh, Austin, Texas. Yep. Um, but let's talk specifically about Orlando. It, yeah. This is a pretty interesting market. Why did you think it was going to work here? Several reasons. I mean, um, you know this because you're a young audience, right? But the average age of this city is 34, right? It's a, that's a young city. That's a very young city. The average age of an MLS fan is 34. So it's a perfect combination of the two. Um, we've got a young city. We've got a growing city. For our size, we're one of the fastest growing cities in the country. We've got a great demographic. We've got people from all over the world. Um, so all of those things were, were great factors in our favor. You've also got the fact that this is just a great place to live and work and visit. People want to be here. You know, we have the weather, we have the coast, we have the attractions. There's lots of good things happening in Orlando that help you attract visibility, players, all of those things. Um, and as importantly was the fact that there was a relatively uncompetitive or non-competitive marketplace. We only had the magic, right? I don't say that in, in a derogative way. What I mean by that is for the size of city, there was only one other major, mm -hmm. uh, major league sports team, and that's quite unusual. What that gives you is it gives you oxygen. It gives you the oxygen to breathe, um, and the oxygen is the media. Mm -hmm. you've, you've got to get to the media, and you've got to make this relevant. And in a, in a city with only one other major competitor, that gives you the, the room and the space to breathe and do that. All of those factors, um, and then the fact that the city was just very, very welcoming. Mm -hmm. Met with the mayor. Um, very early on, and he was very welcoming, very supportive of, of doing the right things. You put all that together, Orlando was the right marketplace. Is he, is he aware that if there were an election right now, you would beat him for mayor? <laughs> Does he know that? It may not be your interest. No, it's so. not my interest. <laughs> it, it has been Good. mentioned, but it's not yeah. my interest. Yeah. Uh, and he does a fine job at it uh, as well. The, yeah. um, going back to the Orlando, and the ma you, you referenced the magic. Yeah. And one, one of the things that I find interesting is you now have, they just had their 25th anniversary season. And <coughs> one of the things I think is interesting about them is you now have the first wave of kids yeah. who have grown up here not knowing of any, uh, of, of not having a sports uh, franchise, a major league sports franchise. Right. So, you, so there are now second generation sports fans of Orlando teams, Yes, is that something that you have been able to capitalize on, do you think? Yeah, you know, I think what we've been able to capitalize on is the fact that the city wanted an identity. Yeah. The city was striving for an identity. That was the thing that struck me when I visited, is here was a city that people didn't know about. Because I was, I was a lot like, I guess, the average Joe outside of Orlando at that time, who thought, and I'd been here three or four times, always for work, and I'd always been to the attractions. Mm -hmm. Not that I wanted to go to the attractions, but that was where, right. that was where work was, conventions and conferences and, and so on. 
So I was one of those you know, poor fools who thought I drive was downtown Orlando because I'd not been anywhere else. And then when you come to Orlando and you see there's, this, there's a really thriving city, you know, north of there, um, where the citizens live, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's, that's, that's really, you know, going places and dynamic and young and, and, and doesn't have an identity. And so I think one of the things that we, we locked onto very quickly was that we could be part of that identity and part of the growth of that identity. It's one of the reasons we call it city. You know, it was, it was we, we wanted to tap into the, the spirit of the, of the city uh, and give the city an identity and something to root for. So what were, what were some of those media strategies? I mean, and, and maybe take us through the debates yeah. about the team name. I mean, you could have done, done SC Orlando or FC Orlando or yeah. anything like that. Why, I mean, you said why city, but what were, what were some of the yeah. other considerations? Well, you know, it, city was, was really pretty much top of the list once, we'd, once I'd seen um, the community and, and what it was looking for. And, and it, was, it was also a little unique because at the time nobody had used city in a name. And it's quite, it's quite traditional in Europe sure. and, and the like to use city in the name, but it hadn't been done in the US. Now, of course, it's been copied several times, New York <laughs> and everybody else now thinks it's really cool. Um, but Orlando was first, right? I mean, you can remind them of that. Yeah. Um, so we, we did something that was really kind of non-traditional and yet at the same time traditional and mixed them together. So it was a, it was a pretty easy decision to go with the name City uh, from the get-go. Um, it's also easy to chant and sing as well, which right. is, you know, it's like, you've got to think about that, right? It's which you knew from Stoke City, right? Yep, so, yeah. so exactly right. You've got to, you know, you, you don't want to be called a rattlesnakes or something, because it's like, you can't, what the hell are we going to sing? What are we going to do with rattlesnakes? <laughs> <laughs> like we can't well, do anything well, this. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, see, it, it just, it just kind of fit together from that perspective. And then, um, of course, the colour purple came along. Right. And that was, that was a, um, again, it was a kind of a lucky happenstance. We were, we were designing the logo. We were working primarily at the time with blue, red, and, and a hint of gold. Um, and the designers came, and they, they'd done about three or four mock-ups, and they, they said, you know, this would look really good if we, if we took the blue and we made it purple. It would really stand out. I was like, okay, well, we're going to do some more mock-ups. Let's do it. And they did, and they came back, and, and it, it was very clear. It just popped, you know. And so that got me thinking about, well, purple. You know, no one, no one plays in purple. No one uses it. We could own that color. There's probably, there's really only Fiorentina that uh, of any consequence that uses the same color. So it could make us unique and, and, and great branding. So those things kind of all came together at the same time. And, and, and then winning really helped. You know, that first right. season, winning a championship, that, that made a big, big difference because people, people believed in us from there. Really. Yeah, they, they gave you credibility. Yeah, yeah. Not instant credibility. Yeah. Has that purple, you say it's, it's not, what you're saying, it's not in wide use. You're referring to globally. So have yes, you found that? Globally. And, and I know that was part of your strategy too, was to yep. be a, especially to pitch towards South America. Yeah. Was, I mean, so that was, cal yeah. I mean, a lot of this seems calculated in the best sense of that word. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thought out. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thought through. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, the purple was thought through. The name was thought through. The choice of the city was thought through. Um, our marketing has been very, very thought through. Our target audience, which is you, by the way. Um, has been very, very thought through. So, you know, everything that we do from a marketing standpoint is aimed at 18 to 35 year olds. Um, and, and for good reason. Not only are you our marketplace, but you're actually easier to reach than, than other components of the marketplace. So it, it, it just fits well together. So you, you put those things together and you put the right rock, excuse me, the right marketing plan in place. And, you know, we, we are where we are. Um, I knew when we came from Texas that we had to be relevant in the media. Um, TV, radio, that's why we, we work so hard with our relationship with Clear Channel, uh, with 104.1. Uh, we were fortunate to have a couple of big fans in, you know, Daniel Dennis and Tom Van and Jim Phillips, uh, people like that to, to help us get the word out there. Um, we were given space and time by the, by the TV channels, which was critically important too. Uh, and we worked hard at it. We worked hard at, you know, providing them with the insight, the information. You've got to be and this is what is changing now, actually, but for the last 10 years, um, you've really had to be an evangelist. You've had to go out and, and sell the sport of soccer to, to everyone. I remember there was a, my first meeting with Pat Clark, and we just announced, Pat Clark works at WESH, uh, is the sports anchor there. Um, and we'd announced that we were coming to Orlando. Adrian and I were, were together at the press conference. And then we did a little mini kind of press tour around to the diff different TV stations. And uh, we went to WESH and Pat interviewed us, and, and he, you know, the, the camera stopped rolling and he pulled us to one side and he said, well, I'd just like to say, he said, you know, you two look like really nice guys and you seem like good guys and uh, wish you all the best, but this, you know, this isn't going to work. You know that, don't you? 
And we were like, oh, okay, well, thanks for sharing that with us. And um, he said, well, you know, lots and lots of um, minor league teams have rolled through here before and they've all packed up, you know, within a year or two years. And, you know, it's really not going to take off. And, but, you know, good luck with it. Right? Yeah. And um, that, was, that was Pat's, that was, to be fair to Pat, that was Pat's view because he'd seen teams roll through and not do well. Um, and it was great to kind of, we have a good relationship with him. So it's great on the night of the uh, of the announcement down on Church Street to to call him out, you know, uh, right. ask him ask him if he thought we could make it from here. So when you, when you're trying to sell a team, you, you have not even really put down footprints in the market, and you're doing the media tour, and you're right. meeting people for the first time, yep. and you hear a kind of reaction like that. Yeah. Um, do, do you go back and look? And did you study <coughs> the organizations that had failed here before so that you could try to not repeat their mistakes? No, if I'm well, honest. So what did you do then instead? You, you have to have conviction in and belief in your own execution, your own strategy. I knew what could... We, remember, we'd spent three years in, in, in Austin. So yeah. I knew what didn't work. And I'd learned from that. And we knew what... Therefore, I knew what could work. It's, it's going back to the Stoke City thing again. It's like, put onto one side of things that don't work, focus on the things that do work, and make them work for you. Um, that's what we did here. It was like... When people talk to us about the failures, say, in Tampa or Miami with the, with the last MLS teams, that was 15 years ago. In, in soccer's evolution, that might have, you know, that's like Jurassic Park. It's, right. there's, there's nothing to learn, right? They, they've gone. The dinosaurs have gone. The market's changed. The access to the game has changed. The media, ch everything has changed. So even though it's only 15 years, for us, it, was, it might as well have been a lifetime ago. So there wasn't, a lot of, there wasn't a lot of benefit in going back and looking at those models. It was about how do we make this model work? Um, and all those factors were in place to make Orlando a great marketplace. What we had to do was capture the hearts and minds of the 18 to 35 year olds and get them to come out to games and get them to believe in this product. And we knew we had a good product. We'd proven that in, in, in Austin. Um, I knew I had a great coach in Adrian. Uh, we knew we had good players and I knew we had a chance of winning the league that year. So when we won it, you know, it wasn't sure. it wasn't a surprise to us. Um, it was part of that plan. Um, now you can always trip up along the way, but you know, fingers crossed, and with a little bit of luck, you get those things right, and that's what we did. So you put into that mix then a winning strategy, and and that really helped kick on in 2012. You bring up a, a, a couple of interesting points that that coalesce in one question that I want to ask you, which is um, the the target audience of 18 to 35 year olds. Yep the different ways in which fans of all ages now interact with, engage with sports and sports content, and in fact, to all entertainment yes. content. Yes. Um, and the different ways, the different channels and pathways you have of reaching them. Yes, you went to WESH and mm -hmm. talked to Pat Clark, but of yep. course, there's social and digital, and Absolutely. those of you in the sports marketing Absolutely. program you know, know that this is at the very core of what we talk about. From your perspective, how has the business changed? Where is it in those regards? Mm. How, do you, how do you take advantage of it to build the critical mass that you have to this point? Well, I think you, you touched upon a really key part of it, Josh, with your question, which is the third element, which is social media, and social digital media. And we do, uh, as you know, if you follow us, we do an immense amount of work in that area. And it's, it's, it's fortuitous because that's the way our target audience really wants to be communicated with. So it, it's bringing those two together really, really helps your marketing strategy. So we needed, you know, to be successful, we needed to use digital media, we needed to use social media to reach our core audience. Mm -hmm. And then we were really utilizing things like radio and, and TV and, and things like that. Not TV advertising, but, but TV, you know, editorial TV publicity through the news and so on to reach the mass marketplace of Orlando. Um, but, but for the core marketplace, our key there was social media, and we've done tremendous amounts of, of work in that area. I honestly put that down to our team back in the office, and that's, it's a very, very young team. If you came in and, and visited with us, it's, it's like a you know, frat house of 50 people. I mean, if d we posted a video um, of what happened this morning in the office. We, the, the office team, um, front office team, just won the XL Soccer Outdoor Championship, which is, I mean, Fantastic. I mean, That's great. Probably gets us into yeah. CONCACAF, I'd imagine, Champions League. Um, <coughs> but anyway, so five guys in the office or whatever it was won this championship. And they come barreling out of this office singing in Portuguese and English with the trophy, you know, <laughs> a, a megaphone, everything else. That's our office. That's, that's, who we, that's, that's who we employ. You know, it's 
and it's those guys who really run the social media strategy. So I, I let them get on with it. I mean, I do my own Twitter account and Instagram and Facebook and stuff, but you know, they, they drive that, that interaction. They know what, what our audience wants. They know how to engage with them. And mostly what I encourage them to do is have fun because at the end of the day, we're playing a game, right? right. We're, not, we're not making rockets or you know, canned goods or we're, we're <laughs> playing a game. Right. It should be fun. Yeah, and I think, uh, just to point out, we, you've hired, I think, six graduates of ours at various yep. points that are full-time, yep. and I think we have, we have two who are still with you and one yes. who has gone on to NYCFC. We don't talk to her anymore. Yeah. Uh, no, she's awesome. Did we have one that uh, went on to ESPN? So and one went to ESPN Deportes, right. so yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So, and I'm not sure what's happened to the other two, but that's yeah. so, yeah. you know, th we have full sale grads who are having fun uh, with right. Orlando City. Um, um, you talked earlier about um, your first exposure to soccer. Yeah. How do you think that compares with the way that American kids are experiencing uh, soccer now and, and how they used to exp experience the sport? What has changed for them? I think what's changed, what's really changed for them is if I look back even 10 years ago, the game looked like an Americanized version of the sport. It wasn't true to itself and it wasn't true to its authenticity, mm -hmm. to its roots. Uh, and so there was cheerleaders and, you know, t-shirt cannons and right performing dogs at halftime or whatever it was, <laughs> right? And, and that's not what soccer's about. It's, we're, we're teaching a generation to, you know, have focus and not have ADD, right? Because we, it, you've got to watch the game. You've got to watch the game, you know? And you've got to, you've got to come before the first whistle and you've got to stay to the last whistle because it could happen at any time. So that's really, I think, what we were doing with the game. And I think it's one of the reasons why the early days of the MLS were so rocky was it was almost too Americanized. We were trying to take an authentic sport and we were trying to like, you know, make it like baseball or, or basketball, right? Where there's, where there's breaks every five seconds. There's no breaks in soccer, right? We don't break for anything other than, really other than half time. So I think those two were, they were juxta opposites really for the sport. I think if a, if a kid goes along today, I think you'll see something that's that's very akin to going to a Stoke City game or a, a game in, you know, in Rome or, or Milan or Barcelona or anywhere else. He, he's, he's, he or she is going to see a very, very authentic product. Um, and that's good for them because yeah. that's, that's the way it should be. And I think, I think it's what this generation wants too. They want, they want the authentic game. They want to be connected to the game that is played around the world the way it's played. Do you, do you think it's helped? I mean, over the last five years, another of the changes has been in media. NBC has been showing the English Premier League games, yep. and, and Fox, I think, has job. been showing yep. uh, some of the other European leagues. And, and so that the fans could see, hey, this is the authentic game, and it can work here. They got yes. more accustomed to that? Definitely. I think if you look at the last 10 years, even the last five years, what the things have changed for us in the sport have been dramatic. I mean, <clears throat> first of all, you've got the exposure to the media that, that, that we never had before. There's, there's now um, only 33 days in this country, though, where there isn't live soccer on television. There's 28 channels dedicated to the sport in the US, mm -hmm. most of which we can get through you know, standard, standard cable packages. Um, so you put that together, and then on top of that, you think about social media and the revolution we've had in social media, the connectivity that we all have to the rest of the world and the conversation about the game. And then on top of that, you think about, I know you've got programs here, Josh, you think about the gaming industry, mm -hmm. right? We, we've raised a whole generation of people who play the game through their thumbs, yep. who've never kicked a soccer ball, but they know who the left back at Real Madrid is because they've been him, yeah. right? Um, and they've, they've played the game through his eyes. And so there's, you put all those things together and the sport, the industry is in a completely different space than it was even 10 years ago. Yeah. And you know, this is the generation that will benefit from that and the kids coming along behind it will generate, will benefit from it. It's, 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 I, we see that here just by looking at, sure. at, at the colors and the jerseys that we see in the audience. Let me ask just a couple of more and then I know you guys have some questions and we'll open it uh, to you guys and you guys out on the live stream. But let's talk a little bit about where you are today. There have been some, some really fantastic developments uh, just in the past couple of weeks and, and going back a couple of, of years even. Let's start with um, when Flavio came in mm -hmm. as uh, and joined you as, as major and, and came yep. in as majority owner, yes. Yep. Yeah, that was a, um, again, that was part of our, our planful move towards MLS. One of the things that we did when we, when we first announced, we said that we, we wanted to bring Major League Soccer to Orlando. That was the reason we came here. Um, and as part of that, we, Im we immediately started a dialogue with, with Major League Soccer. 
and really sat down and just said, look, we want to bring the MLS to Orlando. Tell us what we've got to do to do that. And they, they said four things. It was prove the marketplace, which was the fan base. Prove that, that there's sponsorship support here, uh, that there's major sponsors that will get behind the team and provide that revenue stream. Um, you've got to have a downtown stadium or the commitment to a downtown stadium. And then the ownership group is, is critical to you. You've got to have the right owners on board. So we, we planfully worked our way through those four. You know, we proved the marketplace. We won the highest attending minor league teams. Um, we proved that the sponsors were here and that we'd get behind the team. Um, we worked diligently and very, very hard to get a downtown soccer stadium. Uh, and that's where we are today. And then, of course, the last piece was to find the right kind of owner because this takes, it takes a billionaire to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the head of the tribe has to be a very wealthy man, <laughs> right, these days, or, or lady. Right. Um, so we, we set about, you know, raising our funds and, and bringing in, as a traditional business would, bringing in other investors and, and growing out the base. Um, I wanted particularly people that, that knew Orlando and had good connections because think about it, I, you know, I, obviously the accent is not from Orlando, right? Um, so I didn't come from here. Right. I didn't, when we got here, have a lot of contacts in the community. So it was important we had some local owners who could use their network to help us, you know, gain, just gain stability and gravitas and, and use those networks. And then along the way, of course, we needed, we needed a major, major investor who was gonna help us get to the next step. And that was where Flavio came in and he was, um, he was living in Iowa. Um, he's obviously Brazilian by birth and he's, he made his, his money and his business there. But he moved with his family to Iowa about uh, five, six years ago. Uh, and so was, was essentially was a soccer dad, mm -hmm. you know, taking his son Breno uh, around to games in, in Orlando and uh, playing on one of the local youth teams. And a massive passion for the game, interest in the game. And like myself, could see where the game was potentially going in the US, wanting to be part of that. So it was a, it was a really great fit. A kindred spirits with you in that regard. Yeah. What, what has he specifically brought to the direction of the franchise? Yeah, a lot. Um, I mean, first of all, he's a, he's a great visionary. He, he sees the bigger picture of where the sport is going in this country. And, you know, one of our goals as an organization, yes, we want to be, we want to be relevant to the community locally and we want to be a great partner in Central Florida, but we also want to build a global soccer brand. You know, we want to be, and we will be, one of the greatest soccer teams in this world. Um, and that's part, of our, that's part of our job. So he brings that perspective and he brings that, that view. Uh, and so we, we run this, this dual strategy of being relevant and connected and engaged in our community, but at the same time building a relevancy in the biggest visited marketplace in the world, in the biggest sport in the world. Um, and that's, that's Flavio's vision. That's a, you know, a, a strategy I'm very, very happy to execute on. And we said many, many times, you know, we, we'll be everybody's number two team. Because <laughs> when you're dealing with everybody, it's a big right. number. That's right. right. The third metric was the stadium. And uh, yeah. We're building the downtown stadium now, and yeah. you're back in a renovated Citrus Bowl. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you feel the title shift the way we all do, just being in the Citrus Bowl and having it all yeah. decked out oh, yeah. in purple as opposed to your being what felt like being a... a in a rented uh, house. A, a rented yeah. house, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Even, and even though it's still rented in a way, right, yeah. I mean, it's, it feels more like you own it. We've been able to decorate because the new one, it. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. exactly. They, they've let you paint the wall. We've let you paint the wall. Um, uh, bring our own furniture in. So, so yeah. talk, but, but talk about yeah. that, what it's meant this year and the commitment that you guys have made to the new stadium to make yeah. it yours. I think the, you know, the, the year when you've kindly mm -hmm. skipped over a year, which is the year down at Disney, which was a difficult year for yeah. us, because we always knew we had to move out of the Citrus Bowl while they, they tore it down and rebuilt it. And we really had very little choices in the community of where to go. Uh, and so Disney was, you know, was, it, was, it was that, quite honestly, or take the team dark for a year, which we really did not want to do. So it was the less with the two evils. And um, having gotten through that year, it was great to go back to the Citrus Bowl. And you know, I know some of you have been out there, some of you may not have been out there. It's a very, very different Citrus Bowl than it was even two years ago. It's, it's brand new from the ground up, great facilities, you know, there's not a bad seat in the house. Um, it's a great lower bowl now. It's all completely, you know, surrounded. It's it's a great venue to play in. And of course, we had great memories there. You know, we won two championships there. We didn't lose a lot of games there. It was our house. Um, so to go back and be able to, to say, decorate it in our colours and really make it feel like our home, even temporarily, was a big step. And it's 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 proven to be a great place to play. Imagine though, you know, the atmosphere we create in that stadium and you take that down the road to a soccer-specific stadium, mm -hmm. and you put it in the appropriately sized house, and it's gonna be 
magical. It's going to be very different. How much fun? I know it's been a lot, a big challenge, but there has to have, I mean, especially when you had the situation where the states yeah. uh, put a hold on the money that they were going to, to fund, uh, help use to help fund the stadium, yep. the new one. Um, the challenge is in the fun of, of being able to put this together and build, build your own house. Yeah, I smile because it hasn't it hasn't felt like fun on, on a lot of occasions. Um, it, that was probably the biggest. You know, if people ask us what was the hardest job, it was that job. It was sure. getting, it was getting political commitment to to building a downtown soccer stadium. People wanted us out on I Drive. People wanted us all over the place. But we were we were very committed and very focused to being in downtown. It's where it's where we should be for the good, the longevity of the franchise. It's where we should be for our fans. Um, it's where we belong as a football club. So we were we were very focused on making that happen. Um, it was tough, you know, to get to get the backing of the community behind a new project mm -hmm. for a new sport was not easy, uh, but we we did it, um, and we'd gotten all the way really to the end of the path uh, when the state kind of threw up on us yeah. and you know <laughs> pulled everything back again, having once committed it. Yeah. So that was that was a, a that was a tough stage, but what what that opportunity which is really what it was, um, and the first kind of three months in MLS gave us was an opportunity to really capture some meaningful data and look at what we were doing and assess what we were doing in light of where we were going. Um, and before, prior to this year, you know, you look at our data points for attendance and we went from the old Citrus Bowl averaging about 8,000 and then we sell out 21,000 for our championship game in 2013 and then we go down to Disney where we can only have 5,000 fans, right? And then we go right after 5,000 fans, our next game is 62,500. So, you know, those of you who are math specialists, you know, when you, you, put that <laughs> on a, you put that on a piece of graph paper, it looks crazy. So we needed to know how big a marketplace yeah. is this. And we, we felt for the longest time that this was a marketplace like the Pacific Northwest. In my mind, I'd been really fascinated along the lines of Portland. I saw us as another, <coughs> excuse me, as another Portland. And in reality, where we are, we're somewhere between Portland and Seattle mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of size and relevancy. Um, we are the 19th biggest marketplace, but we're the second highest attended team in the whole league. We're the third most relevant marketplace in the league today, uh, alongside New York and LA. So, you know, we are, we, are, we are punching way above our weight and we had to have a stadium and a plan for that stadium that enabled us not only to service that need today, mm -hmm. but to service that, that growing need into the future. And that's why we decided to you know, take it back under our own control. There's a good point in that, right? And, I, and it's one of the reasons why I think you guys are such a smart franchise, which is you knew who you were. Yeah. And you took a set, what could have been a setback, and you said, okay, well, let's, let's reassess where we are. Do we need to keep pushing in this direction? Or, right. or, or can we see an opportunity that remains true to us and who we are and what we want to do and, right. and, and move on and learn from that? So, all right, yeah. so let's let's stop the formal part. Okay. Let's go out to the informal part. I'm sure you guys. I mean, you can tell what a what a success story this franchise is, and and what a, a thoughtful uh, person Phil is about the entire uh, topic. Uh, we're going to bring a microphone around. Uh, third seat in, second row from the top. Right there. Thank you. Do I have to stand up? I know. I guess You're fine. Know. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know what advice can you give to anybody that is actually trying to like open up their own company and, or like just what you're trying to do? What kind of advice can you give to them? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I think what, whatever it is you want to do, whatever it is, and you don't have to tell me what it is, but whatever it is, it's got to be your passion because you're going to be asked to work um, too many hours. You're going to be asked to make big sacrifices. Those sacrifices, not just monetary, they'll be family sacrifices and all sorts of things. Um, and if you're not doing for something you're passionate about, you're probably not going to sustain it. Um, and it's not about making money, by the way. It's not about making money. Money follows passion. Passion doesn't follow money. Right? So it's got to be something that you're passionate about and uh, you believe in. And then just go for it. Figure it out. Do, your, do as much due diligence as you can on the front end. That was, you know, then you don't have to pay for your mistakes. That was one of our mistakes in Austin. We were just in the wrong marketplace. We were doing the right things in the wrong marketplace. Um, and that doesn't work for you. So your due diligence on the front end is important, but really it's got to be something you love doing and want to do. And don't mind, you know, bouncing out of bed in the morning to do, even when it's times are not good for you. I have a 
have one more question. You can I follow have. up, sure. Okay, and what kind of hardships did you have in trying to develop Orlando City? What kind of hardships? Um, you know, mostly mental, I think, if I'm honest. The, um, you, there's nights when you go to bed and you don't know, um, you don't know what you're going to do the next day. Yeah, and I don't mean that in terms of you don't know whether you're going to go to the office or not. I mean, you don't know what the strategy, how to implement the strategy the next day. And that's, that's as a leader of an organization, that's a really worrying period for you because you've got to, you've got to think that through because people are relying upon you to have the answer. So it's the, um, it's the mental anxiety. It's the, it's the nights you don't sleep that, that are the tough nights because you're trying to think through, you know, how do we get through the next stage? How do we get to... You know, over this obstacle that's in front of us, or whatever it may be. Um, other than that, you know, it's just it's it's fun running a football club, right? It's not work, right? My my father worked; he was a coal miner. I haven't I haven't worked in thirty years, right? I've just got out of bed for fun in the mornings, which is why the passion's important, right? Thank you. Let's bring let's bring down to this person right here, Catherine. Do you have questions from online too? Over we'll those in a second, and I'll look at this side of the room too. It's not that he, I got to turn it. Uh, this one right here, but we'll do it. We'll get you guys in. Uh, hello. Hi, Fall, right? How are you? <laughs> my, my name is George Simon. I'm from Venezuela. And, uh, well, I think soccer is my life. And I want to know, like, an advice for of you, like, how to get into this business. Because th this is what I want to do with my life, to get into football business, because okay. it's what I love. So you don't, you don't want to be a player, right? I wanted to, but I couldn't. Okay. Because <laughs> in my country, it's hard to... Good. Good, because there's not a lot of roles for that. That's one of the reasons I asked. Yeah. Is that there's not a lot of positions for players. Yeah, but I still want to be in the in this world, so I want Great. to know good. how to get in. Like, well, how, the good the uh, good news is there's lots more positions that aren't players that are players. So you're in the right side of the equation <laughs> if you don't want to be a player. Um, but no, seriously, there's 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 lots and lots of opportunities. We our playing roster is 28, and we employ about 140 people. So you can see by that, just by that equation, um, that there's a lot of jobs outside of the playing scope of, of the business. What I would say to you is, and I don't know what your specialty is, but what, whatever, wherever you get the chance to get in, get in. So if you're a media guy and you have to get in on the marketing side of the house, get in. If you're a marketing guy and you have to get in on camera work, just get in. Because once you're inside the business, and you're inside the industry, you can grow from there and you can change and you can develop and you can, you know, you can, re, you can reroute your career. But the first and most important thing is you get in. And the easiest way really to get in is, is, is by interning. We've got a, I'll give you a quick example. We have a, a guy who's been with us, he's been with us three years as an intern and he just got his first full-time job with us. And you know, I think probably 90% of the staff were convinced he'd been with us for two years, but he'd really been interning, you know, but he, he kind of, he's, He's just one of those guys, he's done everything for us, and eventually you go, you know, he, we're not gonna let him go, because he's too good a guy. So we just found him, a, not found him a job, but you know, we found him a position that, that he could take up, and he's, he's with us full time. So just get into the business, wherever it is, and work hard, show up, you know, show yourself willing to do anything, because in, in a small business, especially a minor league business, that's what you've gotta do. Let's take one from Thank online, you. and then we'll start to come to this side of the room a little bit too. We'll, we'll go back and forth, so uh, Catherine? <laughs> Hi, Phil. We have a lot of really great, lively discussion from people around the world online. And we have a sports marketing and media graduate um, who's in Argentina right now. And Franco wants to know, um, can you name a person who has had a tremendous impact on you um, as a leader? And um, it might be someone who's been your mentor throughout your career. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've been asked this a few times and uh, there really isn't anyone. That I've, there isn't any one individual. I think, um, I think, to give you the best answer I can, I think one of the things that I'm pretty decent at is taking a lot of things from a lot of people. Um, and so there's not been one mentor, but there's been lots of people that I've learned a lot from um, and then learned how to apply that for me. And, and um, just as marketplaces are different, people and circumstances are different. So you, you, you've really got to take the very best that you see from other people and use it for yourself. Um, and that's, I think that's what I've done. I haven't, I haven't had a mentor per se throughout my career. But. Great, thank you. Um, 
just one more yeah. soccer related question. We okay. have a lot we have a lot of soccer related questions like I'm who sure. do you want to see City play and things when like that. Come in, um, when come in, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I'll just ask one about the expansion of the MLS to the sure. twenty four teams. Um, and so Ivan wants to know um, what would you like to see change um, with the expansion of the MLS? Um <clears throat> if I'm candidly honest, I would like to see some of the marketplaces that I think would be great soccer marketplaces get a chance. And by that I mean, I mean markets like Sacramento. I think Sacramento is another Orlando in waiting. Uh, it'd be a great marketplace. For, and I think sometimes we tend to select markets based on um, an older view of reality rather than the current view of reality. Uh, and I think Mar Sacramento is a current view of reality. It's a great soccer marketplace. It looks a lot like Orlando. It only has an NBA team. Uh, it draws great crowds. You know, markets like that uh, deserve a chance in this league because they can be, they can be leaders. And they wear purple. Well, well they, the they Kings wearing, do. Yeah, the, the Kings, kings do. do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the Magic Sac don't yeah, in Orlando yeah. City does, so they don't have to yeah. stay with that. Right. Let's go right here. Yeah. Hi, I was just wondering. Um, I've heard a lot in the field that once you do something so much, even if you loved it before, you kind of lose that love. <laughs> do you feel like you love soccer more being able Ooh. to impact it so much? That's a good question. Um, there's a phrase which is, there's a saying which is never get too close to your football club because uh, it always disappoints you. It should always slightly be out ahead of you as a dream, right? Uh, that's true actually. Uh, it should be slightly out ahead of you as your dream because we need those dreams. Um, getting close to, to the, your soccer club has it jaundiced me? Has it tainted me? Am I more excited about tonight's game than I was when I was 13? Um, yeah, I'm just as excited about tonight's game as when I was 13, I think. Uh, although it's difficult to remember. Um, I, I think I am. I, I, you know, I'm kind of a... I'm an optimist from that standpoint, I think. I, I, look, I look forward to the games with the passion that I did when I was a kid. And I, I, I love the game in that respect. I've learned... I've learned the, um, the depth of the game and just how, what makes it a beautiful game, what makes it the world's most beautiful game is that it is on the one hand simple and on the other hand completely complex. And somewhere between the two lies the truth of how to play the game and how to enjoy it. But it's, it's massively simple and extremely complex at the same time. And it's, uh, it's a really great industry to be in there's, there's a lot more that's right with it than that's wrong with it. Uh, and so, no, it's not, it's not jaundiced me too much. Um, and I still enjoy it. And it's do you feel like you've been more successful because you were a fan? Oh. Yes. Yeah, I do. I, I think the fan in me and the, the fan in all of us is extremely important because it's, it's, through, it's through that lens and through those eyes that you make the right decisions and you... You see things from, you see things from, the base level, which which is where you should see them from. It's when you when you lose touch with that that I think you make, you know, mistakes, Mr. Blatter. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go right here. You. Hello, my name is Hector. I'm in sport marketing and media. Um, I got two questions. First. Okay. Uh, uh, signing Kaka was something on your marketing marketing strategy, or it was something that came along. No, it was, it was actually part of our. It was it was part of our marketing strategy, but it was also part of our game plan, if you will, for to, to bring talent to the team. We knew that we had to make a big splash. We wanted a big superstar. Uh, we wanted to, an, an important key player for us, and we just happened to be fortunate that we could have access to to all of that, and then also in in Kaka someone who's just a great human being and a great community you know, person too. So for us as a franchise, I mean, Josh has been kind of to say, we know who we are. We do. We, we have a very good sense of who we are. Kakar was a great fit for that, great fit for who we were and who we wanted to be as well. And um, Orlando City did it with Kaká and uh, New York City did it with Vija. Now New York is making another noise with uh, Andrea Pirlo. There's another starting line for Orlando City? 
you, you never know, do you? That's, uh, <laughs> that's the beauty of loving the game, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and if I told you, think about the disappointment of all of those hours that you could be on social media speculating about it, that I would rob right. you of, <laughs> right? Right? It's yes. that I, I couldn't do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's seriousness. We'll, we always look to, we do always look to strengthen the squad. So it's not, it's not out of realms of possibility. It, it's obviously dependent upon circumstances and timing and who's available. Thank you. I'm going to go way in the back because I like to see these guys run up and down as much as, no, I don't really. It's, they like to work the room a little bit. So all the way in the back, in the back row. There's a sports mm -hmm. program after all, right? Should did, be able that's to right. We, right. Should, yeah. we should yeah. at least put should some run exercise yeah. component yeah. Yeah. to it. So. Hi, how are you? Uh, Robert Shaw from uh, Hi, Sports Robert. Marketing Media. Uh, are there any partnerships between Orlando City and the Full Sail in the works? Are there? Um, yeah, we've been talking, right, yeah. for a while. So I shall this over to Josh, can, right? What can we right. reveal here? What can you say, Josh? I don't know what I can say. <laughs> no, we're, I, I, can, I can tell you. We, we're, we would love to do things uh, with Phil and with Orlando City. Um, there are a number of different things that we've talked. We have done some smaller things. We, we created a... a uh, sort of an internship program back yes. in 2011. Yep. Um, yep. And 12, yep. Part yep. of that has led to having six graduates uh, working uh, for Orlando mm -hmm. City at various times, and hopefully there will be more. Yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's on you guys too a little bit. Yeah. Um, and and we're trying to find a lot of other a lot of other different things. And yep. there are a lot of commonalities and senses of purpose uh, that we share. And we've talked about that. And, and you know, one of the things that will will help us, I think, immensely is when we have our, our own downtown stadium, because having that facility under your control. Um, where you can do those things much more easily it allows, it lends itself to doing partnerships with, with organizations like Full Sail much more easily. Um, so yeah, look, look for that in the future, but it's, sure. it's something we've talked about many times yeah, and we'll continue to. Yeah, and I, you know, two, two of our metrics when we do partnerships, one, things that will benefit our students and our graduates, yep. check, and other people that we, we genuinely like, check. So we've got at least those, those boxes checked and just finding the right project. <laughs> Let's come down here in the pink shirt. Hey, how's it going? Hey, good, uh, how are you? Uh, I'm Jamie Colon. I'm in digital arts and design. I wanted to ask, in the near future, will Orlando City ever try and sign Cristiano Ronaldo? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. You know, um, in all seriousness, I would say yes, we probably will try and sign him. Yes. Why not? Bring CR7 to Orlando why City. Why not? Why wouldn't we? I mean, but seriously, why wouldn't we? Think Go about it for a second. Why, why wouldn't we? So he's one of the greatest players in the world, right? We want to be one of the greatest football teams, and why wouldn't we think about Give that? him whatever he wants. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, clearly, you're very generous with other people's money, right? <laughs> I'll take you in the spot of the negotiating team. How's that? Thank you. <laughs> you no, but seriously, it, 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 uh, and it's a, you know, I, people love to see great superstars like, like Ronaldo and Messi and stuff like that. But you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility. That, that's not to say we're in discussions, and please don't make tweet out. You know, Phil Rowland said Orlando City was... <laughs> We're not talking to Ronaldo right now, right? That is not the point. But the point is, though, it, it's, it has that possibility. Whether it's Ronaldo, whether it's Messi, whether it's Tevez, whether it, whoever it is, doesn't you know? Name a name a world player. It, that is the that's the the market in which we work today, and we'll we'll continue to work. Yeah. There's some commonalities, that's right? Kaká's number two social media yeah. in the world of any athlete. Yeah. Second only to yeah. Cristiano Ronaldo. Let yeah. me go ahead and take that microphone. Oh. Hello, my name is Jeffrey. Hi, I'm Jeffrey. from Nigeria, and soccer is life, right? I guess. Right. <laughs> soccer is life. Um, I have three questions, actually. The first one is, how much challenge? There's a lot of hands up, so can we keep it to just okay. pick your best one? Two, two questions. Pick your please, best one. Please, okay. Two, two. Just start with one. Thank you. We'll Thank see you. how good it is. Pretty, please. Start with one. Go. Let's go. All right. <laughs> how much challenge will Orlando City pose right now to bigger teams like Real Madrid? So, so really, where do we where do we rank yeah. and how do we stack up? Um, again, a good question because it, it's difficult to tell that because obviously we play in the MLS and the MLS is is the league that it is and it's not La Liga and it's not the EPL, so we have to compete in the league we play in. How does that translate? I think the game here is is much more um, athletic than people give it credit for. Um, I think Mr. Gerard and Mr. Lampard are about to find that out because it's much more athletic than people think it is. Uh, we have the one thing that we have with American athletes is we have, we have, we have a, an abundance of athletes, right? We have, we have kids who can play the game at a high tempo for sustained periods of time, and that makes it a very athletic game. Um, I think the quality uh, component of the game is getting better 
week in, week out, month, month, month on month, year on year. Um, so I think we'd stack up pretty well against you know, most teams around the world. You, you, if you pick one of the top teams uh, in the world, no, we're not there today. But the league is consistently getting better, and I think, um, I think we'll be a top five league in the world uh, within the not too distant future. By certainly by the middle of the next decade, I can see us being a top, a top five league in the world that can compete with, with the EPL, with the Bundesliga, with, with La Liga. All right. Um, second question, sorry. Okay. Is You're assuming we thought your first one was good, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was. Je Jeffrey, wasn't bad. Okay. <laughs> second one was, um, first of all, I play FIFA a lot. Yep. And anytime I go on FIFA, I see your logo. I want to know what inspired this logo. I mean, I mean, digital arts and design, anyway. Who inspired the logo? That's, yes, like that's I'm inspired. A very by good that's question. a very good. That's I like that second question, question better than the first, by the way. Just, just to <laughs> critique. But, um, so, who inspired the logo? Um, it actually was designed by a season ticket holder, which I'm very delighted about. Um, which kind of speaks to who we are, right? So, um, we had a season ticket holder who happened to be a graphic artist at Disney, uh, and, a, and a very, very good one. And on my desk one day in the office arrived this big box. And we had, to, we had to swap our logo when we went to the MLS. We had to come up with a new logo. This is about six months before, 12 months before. This box arrives on my desk. I open it up, and inside there is not quite this logo, but something quite close to this, and everything else too. A shirt, a T-shirt, a koozie, you know, everything. Like a mouse mat. I mean, li literally, this guy had designed everything and, and a whole booklet on what the logo meant and everything else. And he was a season ticket holder. And it, I went through it, and it was, like he was, it was really, really good. And I called him. I knew him. And I called him up, and I said, David, look, we've got to go through a proper process for this. You know, we've got to put this out to bid and to look at you know, the different um, potential uh, logos we could see from organizations in the city. But my commitment to you is we'll put you in that mix. And we, we went out to him and four other big design houses, and, and he won hands down. One hands down. So it's, it's great to have you do your logo designed by Susan. Can you explain some of the symbolism? Sure. Because there's, there's some yeah, interesting sure. things about this logo. Sure, sure, sure. So um, obviously it's the lion, right? So it's the lion's face. Um, do, do any of you know why, why our nickname is the lions? No. 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 No, not at all. There was, a, there was a former professional team here in town in the late 80s and early 90s called the Orlando Lions and we wanted to pay due deference to the history of the game in the city. That's why we chose the nickname the Lion. So it's about our history, or about the city's history. So that's the Lion. Most people think around him is his mane. It's not his mane, it's the Florida sun. Okay, so it's the flares of the sun. And there's 21 flares, it's not symmetrical. There's 21 flares because we were the 21st Major League Soccer team. So it'll always forever be memorialized in, a, in our logo. And then on top of the Lion's head is a crown. You can see the, the purple crown with the three points on, uh, and that's to symbolize the, the championships that we won as a minor league team. So that minor league history will always come forward with us in our logo as well. So that's, that's the symbolism of it. That's think awesome. These things Thanks. are well thought out. Okay, Pleasure. let me, let's go with, uh, let's go back online uh, for one thing, and then depending on how quickly we go, we'll probably do two or three more, and then we'll, we'll wrap up the formal part and I'll give you some housekeeping after we do that. Catherine? Great, we have a marketing related question from online. Um, how would you diversify your marketing plan to ensure that you're reaching your target market? You mentioned how social media was a, a big thing for you all, and I know that the just living here in Orlando, the grassroots marketing has been yeah. amazing. So they want to yeah. talk. They want to hear more about you diversifying your marketing plan. Yeah, I think I think we've right now we're we're pretty diversified. We're we're across um, a lot of different medias and, and a lot of different platforms. The, the most important part for me is what you've touched upon, which is the, the grassroots, the community part. And if you co-mingle that with the, the digital and, the, and the, um, the social, that's really where we reach the vast majority of our, of our current audience. Um, I think that the one campaign that everybody you know, points to is the, is the car magnets um, and just how huge that has become. Um, that's, again, it's, you know, it's, it's a simple idea um, that I mean, it came to me sat in a, in, a, in a line of traffic and I was sat behind a car with a Magic logo on it. And I just thought, you know, we should, we should have our logos on a lot of cars. It's a really cheap way to market. Yeah, every car, yeah. Um, Unless you drive a Prius. 
Yeah. Which I do, and it won't stick. Yeah. The I know. The That's gas the cap. only choice, right? The gas cap. I have yeah. it on my For some reason, somebody can explain to me, to me is why the gas cap is made of metal when the rest of the car isn't. It's like, right. isn't that near the fuel tank? When you want, anyway, never mind. But <laughs> so, uh, but the, the magnets is probably one of our best, you know, that, again, that was an area where it really started as an idea just to be relevant. And then we let our guys run with it and, and Magnet Mondays and the whole thing that we did. We now got a, it's over 110,000 magnets out there in the community. So it's, 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 it's just taking a life of its own. But that is, that is a part of the diversification. You let those ideas run. Sometimes you have to close them down after a few weeks because they're not getting anywhere. But for the most part, if they're good ideas and you've got good people, you know, f fueling them every week, then they've got legs. As to the tribalism, as we talked about yeah, earlier. Let's do does. well right here. Um, so the stadium, the new stadium they are building, yeah. um, somewhere you're averaging around 30,000 this year, 28,000, 30,000, I say in the ballpark. Uh, yeah. The new stadium, uh, the design came out, it said 22,000, I believe. Uh, originally, so originally, originally, it was going to be 20. What we're looking at doing with it now is somewhere between 25 and 28. So your main goal with the new stadium is to pack out, sell out every, is it yes. safe to say it's just? Yes. So all the extra fans that are coming in now, what are you going to do? Are you still going to be adding on to the stadium? Um, okay, no good, no, good question again. So, so there's, a couple of, there's a couple of considerations there. First of all, um, you know, we've said all along that we're working with a downtown stadium, a downtown site. There's pros and cons to that. The, the, obviously, the upside is you're in downtown, you're in the urban core, you're close to the bars and restaurants. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a short walk or a short stumble from any bar, right? <laughs> um, which well, is the... You, you get free rides from Wall Street, which right, is a good free, thing. Thank you. Yeah, right. Which thank is a great thing. Thank you. thank you for that. Pleasure. Um, and we ran Sunrail for free when we opened the, you know, the first game, which you could run every day. Uh, but, but no, th there's, there's some real positives to being in that urban environment. The downsides, you, you're dealing with a small footprint, and you're dealing with a defined footprint. So there are roads, <laughs> right, behind us and the side of us. So we've got a limitation in so much as what we can do with the current design on that limited footprint within the context of what we've already designed. What we don't want to do is go back to the drawing board, which would cost us probably the better part of 18 months to redesign everything and then delay everything by another 18 months on top of the construction time. So you now you're talking maybe two and a half years and lose all that momentum. So the decision we took was to take what we had today and reconfigure, uh, reconfigure the existing design to get as many in as we can. And we're working towards that now. We're, we're going to end up somewhere between 25 and 28, depending upon seating capacity and the way that it's configured. From there, to go further with it, we'd have to do some pretty major redesign, like take a stand down in the future and build a stand. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a... a consideration for us, but it's a future consideration, not a, not a present consideration. The second thing is, and this is a business aspect, and as a fan, hopefully you're a fan, um, this, is, this is good too, right? If we can sell out every, every week, right, then we create a waiting list. And if we create a waiting list, then we know that people inside the stadium know that people want their seats and want their tickets. So it keeps everybody honest, if you will, and it keeps everyone coming back. And that's that's a better position for us to be in as a business than building a stadium that's too big and then you're putting your, your, you're putting your employees to work all the time trying to fill it and you're taking time away from the strategy of the business and what you need to do with the business. So it's that balance between how to run the business for the betterment of the fans and how to give the fans what they need and what they want. And there's, there's always a balance between those two. So that's what we're trying to strike with the with the, the new stadium is, what's the right number to provide that balance for both parties? Let's go right here. Hi there, my name's Kerry Allen. I'm a game dev grad and from the same side of the pond as you. Right. So, um, my question was, um, in the US there's a bit of a disadvantage over the UK and the other European uh, markets, uh, just the geographical size of the country. Um, there's mm -hmm. a lot of people it, all through Florida and basically everywhere between here and, and DC that their closest their closest team is Orlando City. Right. Uh, do you think that um, it's better to reach out to really all of those fans, or do you think the resources are better spent just locally? Ooh. 
This is some good questions. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a balance again, right? So uh, to answer the question, I mean, we primarily focus on Orlando. Sorry, not Orlando, Central Florida. I must uh, be a bit more inclusive than that because we really draw from about seven counties. We have a lot of fans over in the Space Coast. We have a lot of fans you know, north, south, and east of, of Orlando itself. So we focus on those seven counties with the vast majority of our marketing. But we do do outreach marketing into Tampa and into Jacksonville as well because we draw fans from there and we recognize that. Um, but you, you get into a law of diminishing returns after a while. What does it take for you to, you know, say, let's take Atlanta and Miami. What does it take for you to get into two major, major metropolitan marketplaces and make an impact and then draw fans? And is that worth, you know, is that value for money? Do you get a return on investment? Um, and I, I think it's difficult to justify the fact that you do. I think what you've got to try and do in those marketplaces is do as much social marketing as you can, do as much viral marketing as you can, do as much marketing that doesn't cost you a lot of hard dollars to bring those fans in and to attract them and to, to get the name out there um, without necessarily putting hard dollars into them. You, you're really going to take away from your own marketplace, if truth be known. Right. So you, you don't want to rob Peter to pay Paul. Thanks a lot. Let's Pleasure. Come, let's come down here in the blue shirt. It's purple. It's purple. Uh, it's, well, the, of course the it's purple. Of course it's purple. Of course it's purple. Now with, uh, obviously, Orlando City's captain is Kaka, and they have also Breck Shea, but one of the bigger, lesser hype players is Kyle Lahren. Um, do you feel that going forward and building more interest in the United States and through MLS is bringing in, you know, more established players, but then basically supplementing them with young, explosive talent like Kyle Lahren. Right, right. And, and can I say, you know, I love the quality of the questions we get now, right? Because that's a question about soccer, right? That, that five years ago we would not have had. And we have to recognize that, right? This is where the community is going and where this whole industry is going. You're getting, you guys are asking great questions. And you're asking great questions because you understand the game now. And you understand more about the industry. So yes, you're right. This is a balance again. You know, yes, we want we want a Kakar because we want a superstar. But Kyle Lahren was a first round draft pick. Kyle Lahren has got all the tools to be a great soccer player, right? Now, I'm not saying Kyle will be because there's attitude and there's mentality and there's hard work and all those all those things he's to define for himself yet as a young man. But the tools, he has all the tools. He's quick. He's, he's, he, you know, he's fast, he's, he's good on the ball, he's strong, he scores goals, he can head the ball, he's got a good shot on him. He's got all the raw toolkit. Um, and we've got a lot of players like that. You look at, you know, Darwin Saran is, is only 24. Higuita in midfield, you know. Ribeiro. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Ribeiro. Rivas. We haven't seen the best of Rivas yet. Mm -hmm. We've got um, 10, 10 international players on the age of 21 in our roster. So we've really tried to, to strike that balance between the Kakars and the Brekshays, the Tally Halls, and the Kyle Larens and the, the Rivases and the Higitas. In playing alongside with, you know, well more well known players like Kaka, it's yeah. it's building the game and bring and yes. making a US team a higher quality as well, right? Definitely, because you know, one of the things that, that we don't I think can give Kakar enough credit for is that he's a leader both on and off the field. And he's a leader to those young players, right? He there's a great example in the game a few weeks ago when um, Kyle Laren like Kyle. Kyle was selfish a couple of times and, and you know, maybe should have passed the ball and, and took a shot. And Kakar, if you remember, goes down the left-hand side, could have scored, but squares the ball for Kyle to have basically a tap-in, right? Finish. Great goal, great move, great goal. But it was also a lesson for Kyle Aaron. It was Kakar saying, see what I just did? You could have done that. You could have done that twice, right? And that's, it's a learning. It's a learning in the game. Without having to say that to him, he was showing him, that even you know a great superstar should be unselfish in front of goal. So there's a great leader and a great teacher. So um, hopefully the, the likes of Kyle will get a lot better by playing with him. Thank you. So uh, Phil just had a thing about great questions, and I want to reach way across my body, way back in this corner. <laughs> Give it to you. Pressure's on you now to ask a really good question again, but you can do it. Okay. So my name is Gabriel Manurong, and I'm from Indonesia. And before I ask my question, I want to clarify one thing from you. So you were born in this country, and then when you were a child, you moved to England, right? 
So I said again. You, you were born what, in the, he asked if you were born in this country and moved to England. But so, no, no. Born in, born in England. Huh? Born in England and I moved here in 94. Oh, so and you were a Stoke City fan? I was, I am a Stoke City fan. Okay, so. Don't say it like that. It's like, okay. I'm like, oh, a Stoke City fan? What's I'm a Stoke so, City fan. So my question is, okay. what, what do you think of Stoke City's, <laughs> Stoke City's way of playing right now with watching the, watching the other team move, move around the ball all the time? Okay. So, um, so go back to you know the start of the conversation. I grew up, as Josh asked me, I grew up watching a very great footballing team, one of the great footballing teams of the 70s at Stoke. Um, so I really, you know, I, it was difficult for me to watch Stoke play in the last um, maybe 10 years or so uh, when they played a very direct game. I love the way Mark Hughes has them playing today. He's got them playing a very different style of football. Uh, it's, a, it's a much more pleasurable to watch. We had some great players. I think uh, Boyan in the midfield who came from Barcelona is going to be a star of the EPL. Um, he's playing really, really well. We've got some really good uh, young overseas players who've joined us. And so I think, I think the future looks pretty bright for them right now. They finished the, the tail end of the EPL season very strongly and they're playing some good soccer. And they've really changed it around. And that's a difficult thing to do. Whenever you change your style um, as a team, you know, whether it's basketball, hockey, soccer, it's a tough thing to do to go from one pattern of play or style of play to another one without having a dip. And they've managed that evolution very, very well. So it's good to see. I well, gotta respect uh, that you guys are not as bad as Newcastle. Well, we, we can't be as bad as Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not even possible. <laughs> you know, right right now, uh, Stoke City is obviously playing an exciting brand of, of soccer, but so is Orlando City. There's a game tonight, uh, tonight against yep. Colorado, correct? Yes. Colorado Rapids, yep, come to town. So what do you expect to see tonight? You know, that one of the great things about the MLS, and um, you'd expect me to say this, right, as a, an over an MLS team, but one of the great things about the league is it's very, very competitive. And, and I, I truly enjoy that about the, the league. You know, you, you can't go into any game thinking, okay, this is, this is a nailed on three points or a, uh, this is an easy win. Right. Um, they're all very competitive teams and they, and they all, on their day, can beat each other. So... Um, whilst Colorado isn't having the best run of it at the moment, I think the bottom of the Western Conference, they're, they're still a potentially very dangerous team and they'll, they'll be looking for three points because sure. we're coming up to the halfway point of the season. You know, it's starting to define your season and where you are and the kind of season you're going to have. So it's important for them to get a win. It's important for us to get back to winning ways and continue our, you know, our unbeaten record at home. So it'll be a tough game tonight, um, as they all are. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, I, I go into every game in this league confident that if we play our best soccer, because we're a really good soccer playing team, um, if we do that, then, then we, can, we can beat anybody in the league. Yeah, and tickets are still available if you've got Tickets are still available. Right. Uh, let, let me ask you one final question. A bit. Beyond tonight, yeah. how, do you, how will you define success five years, 10 years, 20 years for Orlando City soccer? I think um, I go back to, to something we said earlier, Josh, yeah. which is, you know, we, we are... We're working on parallel paths. Um, we're working to build a very, very relevant uh, and loved, let's be honest about it, relevant and loved um, sports franchise in this community. And that means, that means our engagement, that means our, our grassroots programs, that means everything that we do that, that connects and works. As we say at the club, you know, we built this with the fans, for the fans, with the community, for the community. Um, we're, we're working on that and one of our our platforms of success will be, you know, are we everything that we wanted to be in this local community five, ten years from now? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, are we also one of the, the leading sports brands, leading soccer brands in the world in ten years' time? And I believe we can be. I truly believe that. So um, that's, that's how I measure it. And, and, you know, the third thing as well for me is always about the development of young players. Have we bought through the Kyle Larens and the, you know, the the Tommy Reddings and the, the, the Rafa Ramoses, you know, and, and players will always move on. They don't, you know, they, there's all, probably only Real Madrid of this world that's, that isn't a selling club. Every other one has to be a selling club at a certain price. So those players will move on, you know. Will we see, will we see those young players playing at the likes of Real Madrid and Barcelona and Manchester United and they started their careers in Orlando City? I think we'll see that too. Yeah, well, it would be it would be defying yet even more expectations as we talked mm -hmm. about earlier, and uh, uh, we want to thank you for being an outstanding guest and exceeding ours. Pleasure. So, Phil Rollins, everybody, thank you.
Uh, to wrap up, we want to thank everybody who, who joined us online. Again, the hashtag is SMMB Speaks. And we want to thank all of you guys for all of your questions. Uh, the next campus conversation will be on August 5th, same time, same location, and we'll be announcing that guest soon. Thank you guys for being here.